look, we're all adults here, okay? We can be honest about this. I saw it, you saw it, everybody saw it. Jawan Taylor got away with 21 uncalled penalties last week. For those of you that are doing the math at home, that's 110 yards of uncalled penalties. But here's the thing, the penalties that I'm referring to are probably not the penalties that you think I'm referring to. Let's take a look one more time at this, you can see a lot of movement. Yeah, so fun fact, all of those false starts that made pretty much the entire country scream at their TV for four straight hours last week, none of those by rule are actually false starts. Technically. There's kind of a gray area there and a very loose interpretation of Section 4, Article 2, Item 1 of the official NFL rulebook. Heavy emphasis on the word loose there, by the way. But technically speaking, Juwan Taylor is not false starting, and neither are any of the other offensive tackles around the league that are also taking advantage of this loophole. And I promise by the end of this episode, I will explain exactly what I mean by that, because it's a lot weirder than you'd think. But the 21 penalties that I'm actually referring to that he really did commit were for something entirely different. And I still don't know why they weren't called, but we'll get into all that nonsense in just a minute. First, I want to let you know that in a few weeks, I'm coming out to Dallas to go to Patriots at Cowboys in week four, which if week one is anything to go by, that game's going to end like 10-6 because both those defenses are insane. And then a few weeks after that, I think I'm going to be in New York for Jets Giants, which also is going to end up like 10-6 for an entirely different, way more depressing reason. In all likelihood, that game might end up as just a ritualistic sacrifice of Daniel Jones on live television, so maybe it'll be interesting for that reason. But I want to meet as many of you guys as I can while I'm out there on the road. So let me know if you're going to any games this year, especially the ones that I'm going to. And if you are planning on going, but you haven't gotten your tickets yet, by the way, if you buy them through SeatGeek using my code BRETT, you'll get 20 bucks off your purchase. And that works for more than just football. It also works on baseball or concerts or whatever live event you can think of, honestly. Every ticket is backed by a buyer guarantee and they put all tickets from across the web in one spot and rate them on a scale of one to 10. They also have these little color-coded dots that let you know which tickets are good deals with the green dots and which ones are bad deals with the red dots. It's a really good app experience. I've had it on my phone personally for a long time. It's my go-to whenever I need to get tickets for basically anything. So if you're also planning on going to NFL games this year or college football or something more local to you, you can get $20 off of those tickets using my promo code BRETT at the link down in the description below. Uh, again, if you're already gonna get the tickets, might as well get 20 bucks off. So thank you to SeatGeek for sponsoring today's show. And with that, let's get to the subject that you're actually here for, the ridiculous minutia that goes into determining what the hell a false start actually is. Once again, in the real NFL rulebook, section four, article two, item one, the league defines a false start by an offensive lineman as a lineman that takes or simulates a three-point stance and then changes his position or moves the hand that is on the ground. Secondarily, they also stipulate that a lineman who is in a two-point stance is permitted to reset into a three-point stance or change his position, provided that he comes to a complete stop prior to the snap. Now, there is a loophole to this rule that I did not know about before last week, and I credit Duke Mannyweather and Jeff Schwartz for making this known throughout the game. If you don't know, Duke Mannyweather is literally the offensive line guru that all the NFL's top offensive linemen go to train with every single summer. He's the authority on this type of stuff, and he's talked to NFL referees himself to understand these loopholes. And what that loophole actually is, is that when the rule states that a lineman in a two-point stance is allowed to change his position, what they mean is that he's allowed to move his back foot before the snap. If he moves his front foot, that front foot would have to come to a complete stop before the snap, but the back foot does not have to. He can shift his weight around as long as his torso doesn't noticeably rock forward, because moving forward would be a false start. But apparently, when it comes to the back foot, he could even lift that off the ground if he wanted to. So based on that loophole, if the tackle shifts their weight off of their back foot without rocking forward over their front toe, and then if he begins to flare that foot backwards and start his kick step as the ball is being snapped, that counts as them just quote unquote changing their position pre-snap. And if the ball is snapped as that foot is going in the air to start their first step, they are totally in the clear. The league just sees that as timing the snap perfectly. They do not see it as a false start and the NFL referees are officiating that accordingly. 
Now, if that back foot does come down and completes that first step before the ball is snapped because the tackle truly does get out too early, then that's one thing. The offensive line can't just straight up take full steps here, but if the foot is in the air and the ball has moved in the center's hands, then it's not a false start. Or at least it's not going to be called 99% of the time. Out of 48 dropbacks from Patrick Mahomes last week, Jawan Taylor had no fewer than 23 snaps where he took advantage of that loophole to look like he was false starting without actually false starting. And Taylor's not the only tackle that does this, by the way. If you go back to the Super Bowl, you saw several examples of Lane Johnson, the best right tackle in the league, doing the exact same thing as well. He would shift his weight before the snap, but without rocking forward, and have this huge dramatic first step in his kick set so that he could keep his foot off the ground as long as possible while the ball was being snapped, and he never gets called for it because the refs just consider that good timing. Or at least, most refs consider that to be good timing. There are a couple isolated examples where Lane would get flagged for a false start when he was doing literally the same thing he always does and having only his front foot planted as the ball is snapped, but those flags have been thrown two times in the last three seasons combined out of the hundreds, if not thousands of total plays that Lane has been on the field over that time period. Hell, even Taylor himself eventually got flagged for it last Thursday night in one of the last plays of the game when he was doing the exact same thing that he was doing the rest of the game, but the 23 previous snaps that he did it, he did not get flagged. If you ask me, that's a pretty darn good success rate of quote-unquote getting away with it. Now, why was Taylor finally called for a false start at the end of the game despite doing the exact same thing that he had been doing for four straight quarters? What was the difference between that play and everything that had come before it? Honestly, nothing. Like, it was the exact same. I have no idea why that one was called and all the others were not. Uh, maybe the Lions coaches were complaining. I, You got me there. But you know what? The flag rate for this technique overall is like 1%. So I don't blame any of these offensive tackles, not just Jawan Taylor, but any of the other ones. I don't blame them for taking advantage of this loophole at all. And speaking of trying to predict the ephemeral whims of your average NFL referee, that brings us to our real topic of today. The actual 21 penalties that Jawan Taylor committed without getting a single flag thrown his way last Thursday night. And believe me, this is a league-wide epidemic. This is not the false start stuff. That's a gray area. I get it. I'm talking about stuff that is hard-coded into the NFL rulebook. It is as black and white as it gets, and Jawan Taylor and dozens of other tackles around the NFL are getting away with penalties every single week. We know that for a fact. What we don't know is why. Section 19, Article 3, Item 2 of the NFL rulebook states that players who are on the line of scrimmage as a non-snapper, meaning they are not the center, cannot have any part of their body in the neutral zone, and their helmet must break the vertical plane of the belt line of the snapper. Or, in layman's terms, the front of their head needs to line up with the waist of the center. If they're any further back than that, then they are not on the line of scrimmage by rule, which makes it an illegal formation for a penalty of five yards. Again, I charted every single snap of Jawan Taylor last Thursday night, and he clearly and obviously violated that rule no fewer than 21 times, but it could have been even more than that. I just didn't have a great camera angle to say so definitively, so I left it at 21, but that number could have very easily been pushing 30, and he was not flagged for it once. There were even some snaps where there were receivers that were considered off the line of scrimmage by rule that had their helmets further forward than Taylor's. That's how far back he was, and these were blatant penalties that were not being called. And you might be wondering at this point, by the way, if you still happen to be this late in the video, all this seems like just incredibly salty nerd shit. Like, why does this penalty even matter? Why do we even care where the tackle lines up or how far back he is? I mean, hell, some people even made the point that this alignment just tips off run versus pass for the offense, so it makes it easier for Aiden Hutchinson to know what's coming. And that's a fair point. But here's the thing, even if Hutchinson or any other edge rusher knows that it's a pass because of this alignment, if the tackle is so far back off the line of scrimmage that he has a huge advantage in getting to his landmarks after the snap because he basically just has a head start and he can just choke off any available angle for a speed rush, that advantage then makes it extremely hard for that edge rusher to do anything but either bull rush or counter inside with like a spin move or something like that. And we know how much Mahomes loves it when an edge rusher is forced to counter inside because that gives him a free lane to escape outside and get out of the pocket and do what he does best. 
between the illegal formations and the false starts that are not actually false starts, Jawan Taylor is bending the rules like no other offensive tackle in the NFL right now, specifically to give himself and his quarterback an advantage. And you know what? It's working. It's working really, really well in Kansas City, just like it worked really, really well for him in Jacksonville. And I do want to make one thing very clear, by the way, because I understand the tone of this episode might come across as like a wee bit salty. I do not hold any of this against Juwan Taylor whatsoever, okay? It is not his job to enforce the rules. It's his job to push the rules and see what he can get away with. And if the refs are not going to throw flags on any of this stuff, then what incentive does he actually have to change? We're just going to have to see if the league office hands down some kind of mandate to their refs to be uh, a little bit more generous with the flags going into week two. And believe me, that is going to be put to the test early in week two, because Thursday night this week, keep in mind this episode, I believe, is coming out Thursday morning of week two. So tonight's game is going to feature one of our favorite non-false starting false starters, Lane Johnson. If you guys want to join us tonight, by the way, to watch that game live and see if they even remotely start policing this stuff, we are going to be streaming over on the Bootleg Football Podcast channel, not just during this TNF game, but every single TNF this season. Every single Thursday, we're going live about a half hour before kickoff and then going straight through to the end of the game. We're going to have the whiteboard going. We're going to have, uh, you know, fun stats that I don't think you're going to get anywhere else. So hopefully we can provide you uh, some sort of uh, added value through analysis and, you know, just hanging out, watching football, having fun. If you're interested in any sort of alternative broadcast to TNF, again, bootleg football podcast. We're going to be over on that channel starting tonight. So hope to see you guys there. Uh, if not, hope to see you guys at future TNF streams. With that, I have some tape on the Vikings defense to go watch in order to prepare for that stream. And uh, I hope to see you guys there later tonight. If not, I'll see you next week.